Hello everybody, welcome back to Wine Up TV. I'm your host Wayne here with Rick Podley with Charles Krug Winery. When we come back, he's gonna tell you all about these wines. Um, thanks for taking the time to come out. You are, this is a pretty new position for you. You are the regional, international, Some worldly, big title like that, yeah. pretty More things much. things than I can say. Absolutely. And yeah. you're here to talk about Charles Krug. And for you guys that have never been down to Napa Valley, um, I worked at Mondavi in the mid-90s, and I had a chance to have some older vintages of the Charles Krug wines back to the late 60s, mid-70s, which I thought were phenomenal. Um, but the historic winery was built, when was that winery built roughly? Actually, 1861 uh, was the year that uh, Charles Krug opened the winery. And it was uh, Napa Valley's first commercial winery. So uh, ironically enough, we're celebrating our 150th anniversary this year. That is phenomenal. You know, when I lived down in Napa, I had a chance to go to Shramsburg quite a bit. And right. Jacob Schram, about the same time, 1861. The thing with Napa is after the Transcontinental Railroad was built, you had all these Chinese immigrants working around. So most of Napa Valley was built by the Chinese immigrants. Right, that's exactly right. Which is just phenomenal history. Uh, you know, here I live in Oregon. What's, what's the history here? 46 years? It's <laughs> nothing. You know, we have no old buildings, no, right. no really cool caves up here that, that are hand dug. But uh, Charles Krug was always one of those wineries that had so much potential. And, and you know, Robert Mondavi and Peter Mondavi, they kind of, uh, you know, had their differences back in the day. Correct. And now Mark has taken over and really has, 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 has improved the quality of the wines. And, and it's great. So tell us a little bit about the vineyards. Well, the, the family, uh, because they've been in the business as long as they have, they have uh, were very smart and, uh, you know, Pete Sr. Uh, bought uh, a lot of land in Napa Valley. So today they own 850 acres there in Napa Valley and uh, own some vineyards down in Carneros area all the way up uh, into Howell Mountain. As you mentioned, Mark owns some property up there in Howell Mountain area. So about 550 that's planted and they've gone through a pretty extensive uh, replant here over the last 10 years. So it's been about $21 million to put new clone types in there, wow. and, you know, new trellising techniques. and. We're really now starting to see the quality of the fruit really, really improve. So it's a really exciting time to be with the winery. And how old is Pete Sr.? Pete Sr. is 96 years old next month. Bless nine, his heart. Bless his heart. You know yeah. what? Keep living, Pete Sr. This is great. And I think what's really neat about the whole Krug story is how generation, 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 it's kind of like a Sebastiani almost, where, where all those people are keep in line. And I think the passion is great with the, with the youngsters. Yeah, it's a really, it's a neat story in that uh, when, uh, when Charles Krug had passed away, he had sold the winery to a gentleman that was a banker in San Francisco. And then when he sold the winery to, uh, to Chisari Mondavi, uh, which is uh, Pete Sr.'s uh, father, uh, the condition was they would run it as a family winery. So uh, today it continues to be family run and we've got actually the fourth generation just started with the company here about uh, six months ago. She lives in Seattle. So we have a fourth Very generation cool. Mondavi uh, in the business and, and, and working the markets and rolling her sleeves up. I'm ready to change my last name. <laughs> Maybe I can get in there somehow. Anyway, uh, the wines that you're going to be pouring here now, um, all estate fruit? Correct. And that's a, that's a new thing for us. So we, we actually in the past had maybe bought some, some vineyards and what have you. So everything that you're seeing here is 100% is estate fruit. I think it's, it's neat having a, a, a power player like Charles Krug in Napa not only be able to afford to replant, but to do so with a vision. And that's all estate stuff. Let's not buy anything. Let's just make what we have ourselves. That, that's absolutely the case, and uh, it's certainly the, the best asset that we have. And uh, with the market being the way it is, it's a little bit more challenging price it's, point wise. It's uh, very what challenging. A, what, a, what a great economic advantage to have. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about the first wine. This is going to be the Sauv Blanc. This is the uh, 2010 new uh, Sauv Blanc. And 2010, kind of like up here, a cooler vintage in Napa, wasn't it? Yeah, it certainly was. Uh, we've also had some other changes with that vintage as well, and this is really the first year that we've labeled that as St. Alina as well. And, okay. And as you know, the winery itself is in St. Alina, so this is basically vineyard sourcing that uh, surrounds the winery there, and uh, you know we're really, really careful about how we uh, treat that vineyard, of Very course. Very cool. And, uh, we're using uh, dry ice in, in, in the bins when we pick. And, they use uh, them up here. You know, late, late night picking and early morning picking, and uh, we really, really like the style of the 2010. What I like about Napa Valley is everything. Ah. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you. I love it there. Um, Saint Blanc, there's a couple of vineyards up here that plant a little, little of it. 
It's more of a warmer weather grape, mm -hmm. and I love the grassiness and the grapefruit aspects of the Sauv Blanc. And this one, you get that, you get that, I don't want to say cat pissy kind of <laughs> nose on it. I just did, though. It's a term they use, though. But it? it is a term they use, yeah. and it's not an offensive term because it's, it, it's, that's just what this grape gives you. And the neat thing, if you guys have never been to Napa, St. Helena is really cool. Uh, all, all of it. It's just the whole, the, the, the My Camus Rain, the Vaca Range, Highway 29, the Silverado Trail, you can't go wrong. And you know, I, I get all these people say, yeah, but it's become so commercialized. Yes and no. Yeah. You know, yeah, it has to a point, but then there's still those, those wineries like Charles Krug that come in and they're all family owned and that's what they're maintaining. We've certainly seen that happen with, uh, with wineries over the last uh, 10 years up along Highway 29. We kind of jokingly call that Rodeo Drive. And, Rodeo uh, Drive. I mean, you've got castles there that are got tasting rooms and what have you. So we're not, uh, we're not so much in that game, but uh, for us it's a little bit more about the wine. And um, not that we're not looking at uh, doing some changes with the tasting room over the next couple of years, but, um, you know, it's really been about the, the wines and the vineyards for us. And the vision, you guys, I remember when I lived at Mon, uh, worked at Mondavi back in the mid 90s um, and went to Charles Krug quite a bit. The carriage room was pretty much boarded up. It wasn't open. And then you said they come in, they remodeled the whole thing. And tell us a little bit about what they did with the, with the old cedar barrels. Yeah, no, terrific job. They got uh, two buildings that are on site that were back from the uh, 1800s that uh, actually uh, Governor Schwarzenegger gave us the Governor's Award for uh, restoring um, you know, these old buildings. So, Very cool. Um, in the actual Redwood cellar itself, they, um, or I should say the carriage house, they used uh, Redwood barrels that were there existing at the winery for all those years. And they used those to put the floor down in the carriage house and then do the entire ceiling up there, which is just terrific. It's one of those things you've got to see. So we, we use that for, for different trade events and for weddings and special parties and things like that. And um, so it, uh, the room sounds like it's quite a bit different than the time you saw it. I can't wait to go back down there. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about that after, after we get off film. <laughs> uh, yeah, schedule a little trip down there. All right. Sauvignon Blanc, $14.99 a bottle. Very easy drinking wine. Yeah, very clean, very crisp, very, very refreshing. Which very is what refreshing. I love about it. It's kind of a great food wine, I think. Yeah, I've always loved Sauv Blancs. Um, especially from, from Napa Valley. All right, let's hit the next wine. Let's do a little Chardonnay. Uh, old school versus new school, your philosophy on Chardonnay has changed a little bit over the years. Yeah, it has. I think that we are listening to consumers, and, and consumers, while they'll tell you that they're looking for less oak and they don't want to have that barrel obscuring the pretty fruit that we get out of Carneros, uh, we do find that uh, the little nuance of the barrel is actually just a terrific thing for wine. So uh, we've gone from being kind of a 10 to 12 month in the barrel to being a little closer to eight months, and I think you'll you'll get that hint of that in the vanilla and a little bit of nutmeg and just uh, the, the, the pretty butter that's in that, uh, but you'll certainly get a, a, a nice uh, dose of uh, a beautiful Carneros fruit. So. I think we've struck a real nice balance with that, and um, it's not per se a focus for us. We're really more about the Bordeaux varietals, uh, being that it's Napa Valley. But uh, this is a uh, Pete Senior, mm. you know, put grapes down there in Carneros is one of the early guys to do that. So we certainly know those vineyards to say the least. What I like about it is, is you get past the savings basically onto the consumer. There's a, there, there, it's kind of, it, it's tough these days. You have to have good wine for a good price. The Sauv Blanc is 15 bucks, 14.99 retail. Um, Chardonnay, about $16.99 retail, and I tell you, that's a solid Chardonnay for the money. It's got that creaminess, it does have a, the nice oak flavors, a little bit of vanilla, a little nutmeg like you were saying, and that's a, that's a great effort. And this is the 2008 vintage, and 2008, a little cooler, 2010, a little cooler. Um, do you know what kind of clones, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot, that, that, that are most prominent in this wine? I, I want to say Dijon clones, but okay. uh, I've certainly been accused of, uh, of not uh, having my, my clone facts down sure. completely. But, well, um, I say that because back in the day, planting up here in Oregon, they used a lot of Winty clone. Yeah. And Winty clone is great in Livermore Valley where it's warm in the spring and hot in the summer and right. really warm in the fall. It just never did that, that well up here. But now they've, they've come up with different Dijon clones up here and the Oregon Chardonnays are great. Uh, as well, they're getting a lot better now. Yeah, we're actually doing the 09 now is what's coming out of the winery, and that uh, that, that is even uh, just a, a whole uh, different direction. There's really, really pretty fruit in there. It was so, hot here. It must have yeah. been really warm in Napa, yeah. which, you know, I, I just, yeah, different I love than those. this year. Uh, this growing season oh, is a whole different ballgame. This growing season, last growing season, now the birds, the birds, the poor, poor farmers here in, in the Willamette Valley, the birds are all over the Willamette Hills, which is down near Salem. Yeah. And, um, Trudy at Kramer Vineyards, you know, gave uh, gave my girlfriend a call and she said, "Look, she goes, you know what? I had a Gewurztraminer vineyard and they're they're gone. The, the birds really? came in and ate them all. Wow. And so, yeah, oh, I feel so sorry for that. You know, this is not not, not a good thing. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to the Merlot, the Merlot. 
Um, Merlot's always been a tough sell on me, um, not because of the movie Sideways. It's just one of those wines that it, I think it needs a really warm vintage to show its flushiness. And um, this is the 2008. Let's give this a little whirl. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bash you before I taste it, obviously, but <laughs> we're prepared. Yeah, you know the thing with Merlot is is the greenness that I get off of it. Um, more, more vegetative than not. Mm. That's my own. This is my own personal nose and my own palate. I certainly think what you're seeing in the business right now with Merlot is that you're seeing people starting to slowly come back into the category again. Um, and I think part of that is the fact that you've got uh, really guys that have pulled their Merlots out. It became so challenging after Sideways and kind of accentuated a trend that was already out there. And yep. The guys that are in the Merlot business now, they're, they're, they're in it because they're serious about it and they're doing a pretty good job with it. So certainly not a big production thing behind us, but um, got some beautiful vineyards in Yachtville that really give us some nice fruit. And um, we also put some Cab in there, a little uh, uh, Petit Verdot and Cab Franc and 100% uh, French oak barrels, about 18 months in the barrel. And so I think we're kind of delivering kind of more of a cab lover's uh, Merlot. It is, a, it is a bit bigger than most Merlots. And the nice thing, guys, it's all a state fruit, and it's from yeah. Yountville. So here you got a wine, eighteen ninety nine a bottle, that's all a state coming out of probably a first growth, if you will, area in Yountville. And it's, it's beautiful. This is actually, I kind of like drinking wines like this that kind of take me back because you know, people come in here pimping their wines out on me and doing this, I got this great Merlot, whatever, and they're a little flabby, a little fleshy. This is nice. This has got round, rich. It's got some real pretty fruit to it, and it's got some nice structure to it, and I think if you're a Cabernet lover, I don't know how you don't like this as well. I mean, it's got the, it's got some ripe tannins, but doesn't have the big, huge tannins that Cabernets have that can off-put some people, but... Uh, this needs a steak. Nicely. This needs at least a it steak. Need, it, need, it, need, it needs a steak. <laughs> what are we doing after that? Yeah, sorry. exactly, right? All right, let's, let's ro roll right along here to, um, to uh, the Cab. Uh, Napa Valley, oh, Yountville Cabernet Sauvignon. Look at that color. Oh, man, you know, I just, I just love Napa. I gotta come down there for a visit. You know what, isn't, isn't Cabernet King down there? And I'm Cabernet. Sure in, in your days, you, you uh, drank some incredible Napa Valley Cabernet. I was so blessed. I, mean, I remember uh, Shannon O'Shaughnessy, who was a rep for Henry Wine Group way back in the day, she brought over a Screaming Eagle 1992, their first vintage. She told me, she goes, Look, this is a little expensive. It's 50 bucks a bottle. She goes, you want to try it? I said, yeah, let's give this a whirl. Yeah. I wish I would have bought five or six cases back then. That was a hell of a deal, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Now their current vintage is $750 a bottle. The difference now, of course, is you can get Screaming Eagle now. You can get yeah. a whirl in this thing. Eagle, you can get them now, yeah. which is... Uh, you can get them. you got to just yeah. pony up for them. It's like one bottle of that or six cases of this. I don't know. I'd, I'd go with the, the quantity versus versus one bottle anymore. As far as our production at Charles Krug, we, we produce more of the Cabernet than anything else. So uh, As you should. Yeah. I, I think Napa Valley is very conducive to Cabernet growing. And it's uh, it's a strong suit for us, and I think we've always done a nice job. I, I guess we were blessed to have this as a problem and that we were moving through our Cabernet a little quicker than we wanted to. And so, uh, again, back uh, with the, the prices being the way they are, they're pretty good value. Uh, so we just released this 09, I would say, about a month or so ago on this market here. So. It's uh, a little tight in the bottle. It, yeah. it definitely needs to integrate a little bit more. But a twenty one ninety nine for an estate bottled wine yeah. coming from Napa Valley. Yeah, you, you can't beat it. And there's really some, some great vineyards among our estate vineyards going that. You guys uh, are so lucky, well. I know. Yeah, it's a nice blessing. Well, the neat thing about having vineyards in your family for so many years is to manage something that's already been paid for years ago. And then when you had it, when Phylloxera, of course, devastated Napa. And I remember some of this, the right. C.K. Mondavi wine, the vineyards back in the day, they were pretty much decimated. To be able to go in there and to replant how you want to replant. Well, you know, I've, I've actually worked at another at another wine company before that described uh, Phylloxera as being a blessing for Napa Valley and that uh, it sort of forced people to pull some vines out that maybe weren't with the right clone types, not mm -hmm. trellised correctly. And, uh, you know, you, you make an investment that maybe you weren't prepared to make, but you kind of have to make. Yeah. So I, I think you've seen that as being um, another progression in the, in the quality of fruit coming out of Napa Valley. So. I think you see the same thing here in the Willamette Valley. I've, one of the questions I am now asking the winemakers is if you had this whole vineyard to replant again, how would you do it differently? Yeah. And they all go, I never thought about that. And they all come up with their own little ideas. Right, start thinking about it. Yeah, you know, yeah. different rootstocks, different, different clonal selections, different uh, uh, di angles of how, you know, the, the south facing slope versus east or west. It's very, it's, it, it's a good question that came well, up. Well, to your point, I mean, it's just so incredibly expensive that just because you wanted to stylistically change something, you wouldn't go about ripping a vineyard out. So when it gets to the point where you kind of have to, so it, it, it's, a, it's a big time investment and I'm, uh, like I said, I think we're seeing that investment really show up in this fruit now, and uh, because we've had that land for so long, we can still afford to uh, charge a very good value for these wines. Well, so your Yonville cab, you've replanted. How old are these vineyards? 
roughly? Well, the ones in, in this vineyard here, you'd have some of the fruit that's probably close to, I'd say probably 10 years old, and you okay. probably have some stuff that's a little bit newer from the, from the new replant so, that just happened. So moving forward, you know, I'm 50, so in another 20 or 30 years, if I'm blessed to live that long, it's going to be nice to see this fruit, how it evolves, Absolutely. How, how the whole vineyard takes on, and, and as the roots go down and, and, and dig for absolutely. nutrition. Absolutely, and we certainly know the land, we know the weather, and we, you know, we've got some people on the growing side of this business that are really, really familiar with the land and the territory and the turf there, so uh, I think that that, um, that heritage and understanding of the Napa Valley is really a terrific asset for us. So, and I didn't mention this to you earlier, which I know is a, is a big deal, is that the, all of the vineyards that we that we own are all sustainably farmed. So that, that's a you know that that's the big trend, you know, yeah. and, and and I'm glad people are going that way. Um, it's you know the lust, you know, old school. I love these new wineries that go where state of the art, the state of the art, gravity flow. How did they do it 150 years ago? <laughs> no electricity. They were all state of the art gravity yeah. flow. And especially with Pinot, it's one of those grapes that the less you can touch it, the better the wines seem to be. Right. Whereas Cabernet is, you can machine harvest some of this. I'm not saying you do. Right. You can machine harvest it. You can beat the crap out of it and still make a great wine. Whereas Pinot, it's all hand harvested. It's you know, very it's delicate, very, 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 delicate. very connecting and what have you. Yeah, this is all, all you know, hand selected. So uh, you know, that, that's really a nice advantage for us and comes in in small bins. And so we're real careful about that fruit that comes Very in cool. Home. All right. So. Now, my last, the last one we're going to do is my... Napa Valley favorite. I am just a Zinophile. I love <laughs> Zinfandel. I do. Um, there's nothing about a Zin I don't like. I generally like this. I love the spiciness. I love the history of it. I love the fact that Mike Gergich found out what it really was back, you know, back there. Or actually, he um, took some clippings to UC Davis and, and uh, in the mid-90s, they found out what it was. Well, how do you say that? Krasilnicek? Or how do you say Zinfandel? On Croatia, I don't even know. Wow. Yeah, you, know. you lost me on that one. Yeah, did you, did you know anything about that? I, it's a history I'm not familiar with. There we go, with, but, I'll uh, tell you all about it. I'm, after, I'm here to learn. Yeah, you know? it's very, very interesting. Um, they always thought it was a sister grape to the Primitivo, but it's, it's, it turned out it's not. So, But this Infidel right here, when you guys replanted Zen, I take it you replanted this vineyard as well? Yeah, we did. This one's a, a vineyard that uh, surrounds a winery as well there in St. Helena, and uh, it's not a big production item for us. Uh, certainly, we're more focused on the, on the cabs and the Merlots, but uh, I think we do a terrific job with it. Uh, this was the 07, correct? Yes, that's the 07. This, yeah. I'm sorry, the, this is the 07 uh, Zinfandel from St. Helena. Uh, guys, again, you kind of go down to Napa, go to Oakville, St. Helena, go to Calistoga, go to Charles Krug. It's just, it's just phenomenal down there. Um, this wine here... It's got that pruny nose, which is very typical. The thing with Zin is the clusters are so large. So when you when you guys look at a Zinfandel cluster versus Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir translated is 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 black pine cone. So they're really small and the berries are really small. Whereas Zin could be about a two pound cluster. And the problem with Zin is you're going to have green grapes, overripe grapes, and perfectly ripe grapes. So it's taking that balance of sugar and flavors right. and picking them all at the same time and being able to do what you do with it. Yeah, we, uh, we also, as far as the winemaking side of that as well, we're using both French and American oak, which okay. is a little bit unusual. So we, we like the nuance that we get from uh, both those barrels. And, uh, you know, also a pretty good slug of Petite uh, Syrah in that as well. So there's about 24% uh, of the blend is Petite Syrah. Wow. So very mouth-filling, very rich. Uh, I think it's one of those wines that's uh, kind of a great cocktail wine, but it's also got that backbone that could go beautifully with steaks. And, uh, for heaven's sake, just a good hamburger. This, yeah, this is a really good everyday, everyday sip and wine. At nineteen ninety nine a bottle, it's not going to break the bank. Um, the one thing about uh, what you just said, there's 24% Petite Syrah in there. In order for, in California, for it to have a varietal on the front, 75% of the grapes in this bottle have to be what's on the label. So you can blend up to 25% of Petite Syrah, you know, Petite Verdot, whatever you want into a bottle of wine, which makes it very interesting. All right, lastly, tell us a little bit about Charles Krug, the, the tours, are they Monday through Friday, are they all every day of the week? Yeah, we're open seven days a week up there, and I think it's one of those uh, special properties to go visit with having those uh, historic buildings that are on the property there, and, uh, you know, we're getting ready to make a, a pretty big uh, change with the tasting room up there, so uh, we've got a very inviting tasting room that's up there right now, but uh, just about a walk around the grounds there. there. There's a significant amount of land there, and, and it's kind of a park setting that we've got some beautiful... Uh, beautiful trees on the property and it's just a very comfortable relaxed setting and Napa Valley can sometimes be a little bit uh, too upfront and in your face and we're a little bit more relaxing and kind of has that family uh, family feel to Excellent. it. In fact, Pete Sr. lives there at the winery. so that, I'm going to move in. Tell him I'm yeah, moving in. There's Tell a house there for you. So you're, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we're ready for you. What, is there a charge for the tour and tasting? Uh, there is not. If you do uh, like a special reserve uh, tasting, then there's a small uh, small fee for that, but otherwise Excellent. It's, it's pretty much open. Excellent. Yeah. Rick, thank, thank you, you so much for taking the time, I guys. Charles Krug wine's available on my website and
will be available here in the shop. You guys have a great afternoon.